My grandfather performed two really important ceremonies for me. He was the minister at our wedding, uh, and he also spoke at the service where I was officially ordained as a minister. And on both occasions, he gave some, some really good advice. And I know Kimberly thought so because uh, a lot of it had to do with treating her well. And I don't remember which ceremony it was of the two, but, uh, but at one of them, I remember him telling me that I should never go away on a trip or travel anywhere without bringing something back with me to give her or uh, my future kids at, at that, that point. Just something to let them know I was thinking about them while I was away. Uh, I remember saying it didn't have to be anything extravagant. Uh, it could be something simple like from the airport or the hotel, which is why you know, Kimberly got a lot of unopened packages of, of airline pretzels and got a really nice basket collection now of some of those little soaps and shampoos that you get from the hotels. Uh, but, but at least set a healthy expectation. Uh, so the first thing I was always asked when I got home from a trip by Kimberly or, or my kids was, yeah, what did you bring me? What did you got? What did you bring home with you? Uh, and, and I think early on in a person's faith journey, like our relationship with God can be a little bit like that, uh, although it might not be as healthy as what my grandfather was trying to teach me. Uh, but, it, but it's kind of like, okay, well, dear Heavenly Father, we go into our prayers. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day because I'm always supposed to open my prayers with that, right? Uh, but then it's like, now, now what do I want? How do I get God to give me what I want? God, what do I got to say? What do I got to do to get you to get me what I want? Uh, and God, I, you know, I got some needs. Uh, if you don't have some ideas, I can give you a list of some things. But, but here's what I need, and, and how do I get them from you? Uh, like if, if, if I just wanted to make a lot, a lot of money, you could probably do this too. Uh, it's just to, to write a book with a real catchy title. It doesn't even have to have a lot of substance to it, I don't think. But just a, a, a catchy title on how to get God to give you what you want. People love those books, right? So just so you know, those secrets to, to unanswered prayers or, uh, you know, name it and claim it. Use your faith to build your dreams kind of, kind of things. Because early on in our faith maturity, I think it's natural. There's just something in us. It's kind of like, okay, God is God. I get that, and I'm not. So how do I get God to do what I want God to do for me? And the problem with all of this, and you know this on some level, in fact, this might describe uh, what's going on in, in maybe some of your relationships or your marriage or what's going on with you and your kids uh, or with your parents. Uh, the principle is simply this. It is impossible to have an authentic relationship. You can't really have intimacy, closeness with someone if you're only trying to get something from them. I mean, you just can't because there's an agenda, right? There's, there are conditions, and ad agendas, conditions, expectations, those always kill intimacy. Uh, it's just not possible. But the cool thing that we're learning is that John, who we've been tracking through this series as he witnessed, I witnessed the life of Jesus, John tells us that we don't have to approach God like that. Because God already gave us everything he wanted to give us all at once. He gave us himself, right? He showed up. In the flesh. Uh, and, and of course, that's an overwhelming claim. But, but when we start to shift this from just a religious idea, just this theological idea, when it goes from our heads to our hearts, that's when this starts to change everything. Like, like when you start to lean into this idea uh, that I can have a real relationship with God. It's not just a religious to-do list. It's a relationship. That's when you start to really learn that there are, are purposes beyond just what I see. There are actual reasons beyond just these random, seemingly meaningless, uh, even painful, sorrowful disappointments in life. God is doing something bigger. And so as we've been learning, the Apostle John made it clear that he believed Jesus uh, not just because of faith. He didn't just believe in faith for faith. He believed in Jesus because of what he saw and because of what he heard. And he wrote his gospel account as an eyewitness account uh, with the goal of having anybody who read this later on come to the same conclusion about Jesus that he did. He wanted us to see Jesus the way he saw him. Uh, and so as an old man, John's looking back and he organizes his account, uh, what we call the Gospel of John, around these events uh, that, that he said weren't just random acts of kindness. These are actually signs that pointed to something. Uh, and these signs, and in his Gospel, John recounts seven of them we're looking at. These signs were evidence that Jesus was in fact who he claimed to be. But, okay, there were a lot of people back then, and unfortunately even now, a lot of people followed Jesus more like groupies, right? They, uh, they were just what you got in it for me, Jesus kind of people. And, and that's the tension I want us to wrestle with a little bit today as we continue this journey by, by looking at this fourth sign that John built his eyewitness account around. 
And it's probably one of the most famous stories in all the Bible. Uh, it's what we now refer to as the feeding of the 5,000. Uh, and now if you were to look uh, at this area on a map where we left off last week, the nation of Israel is kind of like this big log on, uh, oblong country runs from north to south. Uh, and, and where we left Jesus last week, he was uh, south uh, in the city of Jerusalem. But now he and his disciples are going to start to take a journey up north uh, towards the Sea of Galilee. Uh, and when they get there, they get in a boat. They're like 100 miles away from what we now call Jeru or, 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 or what was Jerusalem at the point. And, and one of the reasons they went so far away out in the middle of nowhere was they needed a break. Uh, they were needing some time just to kind of rejuvenate. Uh, and Jesus had actually just found out that his cousin, John the Baptist, had been beheaded. And so uh, he's probably also needing to grieve, but, but he needs some time away to himself. So he goes out to this remote part of the country. But as typical, word gets out that Jesus is here. Jesus is around. Uh, and that's where the story starts to pick up for us in John chapter 6. It tells us a huge crowd kept following him wherever he went. This was normal for him now. But why were they following him? Because of faith? Because they had such great faith? No. Nobody in the first century followed Jesus because of faith. In fact, John tells us right up front, they followed him because they saw his miraculous signs as he healed the sick. You know, what they saw, what they heard, that's what they continued to follow. So, so just kind of imagine this, all right? Jesus and his disciples, they go way out of their way to get way out of the way of people. And in spite of that, okay, here come these thousands of people, this, this mob, and many of them uh, probably had never even heard or seen Jesus before. They just kind of knew this new celebrity, this, this hotshot rabbi they've been hearing about. Now he's in our area, he's in our region, and while he's close, they want to go see this, this prophet, this miracle worker. And nothing else, maybe he'll do one of his tricks for us too, right? So, so Jesus turns around. And, and he sees this mob, this crowd. They're, they're all in the distance at this point. Uh, and John tells us, Jesus climbed up on a hill and sat down with his disciples around him. It's like we only got a few minutes probably to ourselves here. And, and then John, before he continues the story, gives us just this little detail that's important for what happens later in the story. He says it was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration. Uh, so just kind of take that stick of pen in it for just a moment. Uh, but for right now, okay, here come these, these thousands of people. They're coming toward Jesus and his guys. Uh, they just want some time to themselves. Jesus just needs to revive. But, but he knows why they're coming. They're kind of like us, right? They, they wanted something. They're, they're enamored with, with the shiny things. They want another miracle. They want another trick. They want Jesus to do something that they can go back and talk about and tell people they were there for, right? And they lost sight of the fact, or, or many of them maybe never really even knew in the first place, you know, wait, there, there's a point to all of this stuff. There's a reason. All these miracles are actually signs pointing to who Jesus is claiming to be. No, at this point, they just wanted something. So the disciples, they're watching this mob gather. They're wondering, what are we going to do? Uh, and Jesus surprises one of his guys, Philip, one of his disciples, with this question. You know, Jesus sees this huge crowd coming. It says, turning to Philip, he asks him. He's like, hey, man, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? Now, okay, you, you may have heard this story many times, especially if you grew up in church. But, okay, you need to understand at this point, uh, in, in, in this story, nobody's planning to feed anybody. That's not what they do. Uh, this is just another crowd of people who wanted a Jesus show, and maybe he's going to teach another, like, mind-blowing sermon that they'll understand, like, 20% of, and he'll have to explain it to his disciples later on. But they've been here before. Uh, and they thought they were getting away for some R&R. &R. So now they're staring at this mob of people converging on this field, and they're, you know, they're getting a little narked, you know. Uh, and, and Jesus then turns to, to Philip and he says, Bruh, where are we going to go get food enough to feed all these people? And, and Philip, I'm sure, is like, feed these people? What are you talking about? We don't feed people. We, we heal people. That's what you do, right? Uh, but what do you mean feed these people? But John, okay, remember, he's remembering this thinking back. So he tells us in verse 6, uh, Jesus was just kind of messing with Philip because he already knew where this thing was headed, it tells us. So Philip replies, Jesus, even if we worked for months, we wouldn't have enough money to feed all of them. In other words, okay, Jesus, the answer to your question, of where is nowhere. It's not happening. Uh, in fact, the reason he might have actually asked Philip is that Philip was from this region. This was his home area. So he's like, hey, maybe you know where all the food joints are, where we can get some food. And Philip's like, no, it's not happening. It's impossible. Can't do it. 
And then again, okay, if you grew up in church like me, you, you maybe you remember the flannel graph Sunday school version of this, right? Or maybe you've seen the storybook version where, where at this point this story kind of becomes romanticized. You got the, you got the cute little boy with, with a little sack lunch and, and all the rough edges are kind of taken off. But, but in what really happens here, okay, there's some humor. There's even some drama. So Andrew, one of other Jesus' disciples, he sees this kid and he sees that, the, that he brought his basket lunch. Uh, and he basically says, hey kid, come here for a minute. And as he turns, uh, and, and I don't think Andrew was like showing his faith with this question, at least with the way I read it. I think, I think Andrew was being a little bit snarky uh, with this next, uh, this next little bit. It tells us that Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. There, there's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish. But like, what good is that with this huge crowd? Yeah, I think he's like, this has got to be a joke, right? Jesus is like, hey, kid, you want to meet Jesus? Come on over here and bring your lunch with you so we can share it with all these people, right? Ha, 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 ha. But then Jesus is a real lab, and he does his Jesus thing here, and, and he's like, you know what, Andrew? That's an awesome idea. I'm like, what? So Jesus says, tell everybody to sit down. Like, no, 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 Jesus, okay, you're, you're taking this a little too far. I was just, I was just messing around, right? Uh, Jesus is like, no, no, that's a great idea. Tell everybody to sit down. So they all sat down on the grassy slopes, John tells us. And then again, he gives us another detail because of what's about to happen, all right? He lets us know that the men alone in this large mob numbered around 5,000. Now, why does he just mention the men, right? This question comes up sometimes. Why not the women? Is it because the women didn't count? Uh, no, I don't think that's what's going on here at all. And that they'd like do an actual head count where, you know, is it actually, five, if you're a literalist, was it 5,000 on the, on the door? Maybe, but, but 5,000 at this point was actually a pretty common reference to the size, the equivalent of what a fully formed Roman uh, legion of soldiers would have been. And I think John, in telling us this, he's kind of giving us a little bit of a foreshadow witness to what's about to happen. Because cause some people estimate there could have been as many as 20,000 out here in this grassy field waiting to hear Jesus and watch him do something. All these people with no idea, okay, of what, what's really going on up at the front, the conversation that's going down. So I, I imagine Jesus just kind of smiling at this little boy and reaching down, takes his food. And then, okay, get this, Jesus stops uh, and this is the part, I don't want us to rush by this, okay? The only people that know what's really going on at this point are the disciples, Jesus, this little boy, and maybe, maybe some of the, the stage crashers up front. But Jesus says, okay, guys, got the food, let's bow our heads, let's close our eyes, and, and let's give thanks for the lunch. Uh, but but they're, not, they're not bowing their heads, and they're not closing their eyes, right? They're, they're looking over their shoulders, kind of like, are you serious? <laughs> okay, Jesus, I mean... You know, I, I tried to think of an example of maybe we could relate to here. Uh, and, uh, you know, after weeks of coming to church and we haven't been able to do coffee and donuts like we're used to, right? Uh, what if today I had come in with just like one blueberry muffin and I set it right here. Uh, and, and I just put it there and I say, hey, I got everybody a muffin. Like, I didn't get, I didn't get a muffin for, for each and every one of you. I got a muffin for everybody, Right? Uh, so let's, let's all bow and thank God for this muffin before we share it together. And I think that still would have been way more than what Jesus was working with here according to what the disciples are seeing. Uh, but Jesus, okay, as sincere as he can be, verse 11 tells us he took the loaves and gave thanks to God. It's kind of like, okay, well, well, what's about, are the food trucks about to roll up? Or, you know, is, uh, the, the disciples have to be thinking, this is ridiculous. Uh, like, this is, this is even embarrassing. And I think Jesus is just grinning. He's just smiling. John tells us that he took the loaves and distributed them to the people. Okay, and, and okay, don't rush past this, because to distribute it to the people meant he distributed it. And then he kept distributing it. And he kept distributing it. And afterwards, it says he did the same with the fish, and they all ate as much as they wanted. And after everybody was full, and, and these couple of little phrases, okay, you, you got to realize this probably took a couple of hours. After everybody was full, Jesus told his disciples, now go take the leftover so nothing is wasted. 
And so now there, there are all kinds of explanations out there if you go looking of what actually happened if this wasn't really a miracle. Like people try to break it down. What's the science of this? Like maybe everybody really did come with their lunch uh, or enough people were there but they just weren't sharing. But then when they saw this little boy sharing, oh that's so cute, we're inspired and everybody started sharing with each other and they all ate. You know, maybe. Maybe that's what happened but, but that's just not what anybody who was actually there said what happened. So I think we should go with the eyewitnesses who were actually there. And John says, this is how it went down. No, this, this was a sign. And most of these people might never have even known where all this came from until much later. I mean, because at this point, okay, there's no trucks. There's, there's no box lunches on a table. Everybody get in two lines and, and orderly stuff. No, the, we don't care. We're just hungry. And once they all got stuffed, John tells us, they picked up the pieces uh, and there were 12 baskets of scraps left by the people who had eaten from the five barley loaves. And so it didn't take long before word started to spread through the group how this actually went down. Uh, like this guy created so much extra food. Uh, and the question they're asking, okay, the question they should be asking. In fact, the most important question you and I could ever ask uh, in your life is who is this guy right that's what they're asking who is this guy when the people saw him do this john tells us uh, this this miraculous sign not just a random act of kindness this is a sign pointing to something when they saw it they exclaimed all of a sudden surely he is the prophet we've been expecting like and just for a moment they shift their focus and the reason this only lasted for a moment is because, like you and I, they, they get hungry again. But for now, they're full. And just for a moment, they're able to take their minds off themselves. They're able to take their minds off their, their appetites. And they're able to shift their focus from the miracle, from the sign, to the person who the sign was pointing to. Maybe he's the one. Maybe this is the one we've been praying for and looking for and hoping for for so long. And for just a moment, they got it. But Jesus knew, you know, their, their recognition, this acknowledgement was only temporary. And besides, okay, now wasn't the right time for him. So, so when Jesus saw it, it says well, they were ready to force him to be their king. Because that's where all this was probably headed. When he saw where this was going, he slips away into the hills by himself. And so this was all, what all this foreshadowing, I think, was about. All of a sudden, okay, uh, the, these 20,000 people, 5,000 men, right? The equivalent of a Roman legion. And, and the prophet Moses, they remembered, okay, the first prophet was able to deliver our people from the bondage of Israel. If this is the guy, certainly the second prophet, this, this, this rabbi from Nazareth, uh, the, he's going to be able to deliver us from the bondage of Rome. And, okay, imagine if that were to happen, if that's where this were all heading, imagine the scene. 5,000 men start marching south, right, from the northernmost part of the city around the Sea of Galilee. They're picking up momentum as they go. You know, by the time they leave Galilee, maybe they've doubled in number. They're picking up guys. And by the time they're halfway to Jerusalem, you know, from, from the edge of the border of Galilee, they, they may have tripled in number. By the time they get to the gates of Jerusalem, they're the equivalent maybe of three or four Roman legions, the whole country would come alive, right? Uh, the, finally, the Messiah has come. Our conquering king is here. The land is going to be theirs. Their prayers have been answered. And Jesus knew their hearts. But he also knew, get this, that their motive had very little to do with, with who he was. Had everything to do with what he could do for them. And so, it wasn't time. He withdrew. And as the story continues, okay, Jesus would eventually join uh, John and the disciples, uh, the other guys on the other side of the lake. Uh, and, and perhaps maybe they thought, okay, finally, we're able to get away, we got some time. But once again, the crowds find out where he is, and they start heading his way. And perhaps even now the crowd is even bigger because they just heard what happened. But, but little do they know that Jesus this time is about to thin the crowd. Right, in fact, he's, he's about to call them out. And not only is he about to call them out, but, but he's about to call some of us out. He's about to call me out especially, I know, so, so don't get too comfortable just yet. And here's why, okay? Uh, I don't know, have you ever thought, uh, or perhaps maybe you've heard this from somebody else who walked away from faith, or maybe, you know, they just went church hopping because they didn't really like what they got here, there, and the other place, or, or maybe they just stopped going altogether. Uh, and maybe you said this or thought or heard it, you know, you know, I, I, I just gave up on faith, I gave up on church because I wasn't getting anything out of it. 
right? I used to go, uh, but I wasn't getting anything out of it. I used to serve, but I wasn't getting anything out of it. I used to give, but didn't really get anything from it. And the point that Jesus is about to make is this, okay? Get this, get this, get this. As long as it's about getting something out of it, you still don't understand it. So, so Jesus, okay, he's now on the other side of the Sea of Galilee with his disciples, and John tells us this. They, talking about the crowd, they found him um, uh, on the other side of the lake, and they're all like, hey, Rabbi, they're like, where did you, where'd you get, where'd you come from? Which is not really their real question. They start this dance again. Like, hey, man, how? Wow, 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 well, fancy meeting you here again, Jesus, right? And this time, Jesus just sort of, sort of shakes his head, and he goes right to the point. And he just tells them point blank. I tell you the truth. You want to be with me because I fed you. Not because you understood the miraculous signs. He's like, let's get real, okay, for a moment. You're, you're just here for the food. Uh, you, you missed the point. You thought the sign, you thought the miracle was the point. And, and then he kind of leans into this crowd, and, and he leans into me for sure with what he says here, and hopefully you're going to feel like he leans into you. And, and he just kind of says, hey, come on. Don't be so concerned about perishable things like food, right? Don't get so caught up in what's just right in front of you. Spend your energy seeking the eternal life, the, the much bigger, more, more full life the Son of Man can give you. For God, the Father, has given me the seal of his approval. He's saying, listen, don't, don't you realize what I'm all about? Do, do you not get what this sign's pointing to? Don't you even understand who I am? Do you not recognize God has certified me? And he could have said, listen, 2,000 years from now, people are going to still be telling this story. Like, you're part of a revolution. You're part of something way bigger than just taking a city and a, and a, a land back from Rome. But like right now, all you can do is think about your next free lunch and show. But watch, I mean, the crowd, man, they, they answer, show us a miraculous sign if you want us to believe in you. Like, what can you do? We're, we're starting to believe Jesus. I'm like, we're, we're with you. We got you. I, I mean, we're with you, Jesus. I'll tell you what. Okay, if you'll just do, just do one more sign for us, uh, then we'll believe in you. Okay? So, so, so what else you got? And now, okay, we're going to talk a little bit more about this next week. You really don't want to miss next week. But, but this is exactly perhaps maybe where a lot of you are living. It's, it's like, okay, you know, I, I would trust God more. I would... I would commit, I would take that next step if, if only God would, right? I would come back, I would get involved in church again uh, if only God would. You know, I got, the, I got this little deal coming up when, and, with, and, and if God would do something, maybe, maybe then I'd be able to commit a little bit more. Maybe I'd start giving then, maybe I'd start serving then, if only God. And so here's this group of people who they've already experienced something way beyond belief. And they're still like, you know what, Jesus, if, if you'll just kind of do one more trick for us, uh, let's see. And, and they're kind of thinking. Uh, and, and then they're kind of like, oh, yeah, okay, well, this just kind of popped into our mind. Uh, you remember our ancestors, right? Uh, while they were in the wilderness, they ate manna. Like, that would be a good one, Jesus. Maybe you could do that one for us too, right? And Jesus has got to be like, wow, I mean, we're, we're all the way back full circle to free lunch again. It's like all you guys think about is food. Now, now I, I just want you to think about this for a moment, okay, and then we're done. But this is so important. Okay, these, these men and women, they're standing on the edge of the Sea of Galilee, literally in the presence of, of the light of the world, the Son of God. And all they can think about is their appetites, their immediate wants. All, they can't see past their stomachs. They're, they're, in fact, when you read the rest of John chapter 6, I hope you'll do that later on. Some of you know the story. But on this day, John actually tells us that many, many of them who were there decided to unfollow Jesus at this point. Like, like once they realized the magic show was over and the food wasn't there anymore, they lost all interest in the magician and, and the food truck Jesus. And, and once they realized there wasn't anything in it for them anymore, they walked away. They got everything they came for. And maybe, okay, maybe because of their circumstances and their dire straits, maybe there's, there was some excuse. But you and I don't have that excuse. And, and I, just, I just hope this isn't you, that this isn't me. Because we're on the other side of the resurrection. We're, we're a man who claimed to be the light of the world proved it. 
And then he invites you and he invites me to follow him into this much richer life outside of just here. So, so this begs the question of us, what, what about you? What about me, right? Are we just in this thing for the food? Are you just in this Christian thing for what you can get out of it? And I've been under some, some personal conviction, even with just our attempts now to get back in a building, get back in a routine, that, that if we're not real careful, if I'm not real careful, all of a sudden all the attention comes me on, on just getting back to a weekend service. And listen, this is not, this is not the, the reason that we're here. This is a good starting point, and I'm looking forward to having us gather more and more and more and more. But this, if this is all we're doing, then we're just in it for the food. We're just in it for the show, for what you can get out of them. And, and if that's you, then, then maybe you've still not come to grips with who it is you're really dealing with. I mean, you're standing right there in the light uh, of, of the Son of God, the light of the world. But I'm still trying to figure out how to get some silly temporary thing. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. Come on, don't, don't waste your life just chasing after those short, short-lived things. Don't, don't spend your whole life just thinking about only what's in front of you. There's such a bigger thing at play here. I came to give you something so much fuller, so much richer than just that. Like for us now in this, this 21st century, living in these times of change and, and we don't even really know what's coming at us next, th- this is no small thing to which we've invited, been invited into. This is such a huge opportunity. I mean, you just think about it. What if, what if every Christian we knew, what if every Christian in America, just for like the next two weeks, would suddenly just stop asking God for anything, but, but instead would just simply look outside ourselves and start to really look for practical ways to lead with love? Like what if we really did that? What if, what if we started intentionally loving the people around us in the way that we've been called to love people? What, what, if, what if we were able to intentionally put aside our differences for the sake of relationships? If we would just simply kind of load up on this others, others first kind of thinking. What if we really did that? If those of us just, just within our circle of influence here at LifePoint Crossing would quit asking as much as we became generous in the way that God invites us and calls us to be generous. What if we became as compassionate as God has called us to be compassionate? If we started to submit to each other in the way that God through Christ has submitted to us. Like if we would just do some basic things as Jesus followers right here in our own community right now. Okay, get this. If we would lead with love in our community, the ripples would be felt. They would because we've seen it happen before. So so the question can't be, okay, what can I get out of it? Is this working for me or not? The question that's going to change everything for you. No, no, no matter how long ago you prayed a prayer uh, to become a Christian so that you wouldn't go to hell. Or, or no matter how long ago you put a stick in the fire when you were a teenager. Or took that next step. Then you kind of drifted away. Look, no, the question that changes everything. No matter how old you are. No, no matter how many prayers you've prayed in the past. The question that really starts to change things is the question Jesus was trying to get his audience to focus on. And the question is this. Who do you believe I am? Who is this guy? Who do you really believe I am? And for some, he wasn't anything more than just some magic rabbi. And they lost their interest in him as soon as the show was over. But a few of them would start to recognize who he really was. They started to recognize him as God in a body. And and they responded the way that you would respond. uh, When you start to realize this is God in a body. They quit asking And they just surrendered. And they followed. And and they changed their life's direction. So so I just hope and I pray for me, for you. I hope we're not in this just for lunch. Because if so, we're going to miss so much of the bigger story. Because it's impossible. Remember, it's impossible to have an authentic relationship, an intimate relationship with anybody if you're just trying to get something from them. You could respond to this using Jesus' own words, in fact. Remember, he said, Heavenly Father, not my will, but your will be done. In fact, I think the three most important words God wants to hear from us at any time are, are simply, God, I trust you. I trust you. God, God, not my will, because I know so many times my will comes with a grocery list. So, so let's forget that. Not my will, but your will be done. I trust you. I surrender. 
And, and this is a brand new kind of life we've been invited into. This is a different perspective on everything. And listen, when that becomes enough, that's when life starts to change. That's when new life begins. The, the adventure begins. But, but until it's enough, you, you may have reduced your Savior uh, to the significance of a food truck with some menu that never fully satisfies your temporary appetite. And until this goes from your head to your heart, you're going to find yourself, as one song I heard recently, I love the lyric, it said, you'll find yourself negotiating with the God of all creation. How silly is that? Negotiating with the God of all creation. Let, let's not be consumers, let's be followers. Right? Let's not be consumers, let's, let's leave a mark right now, in this time. Let, let's not simply be consumers, because again, this is no small thing to which you and I have been invited into. This is a huge opportunity we're living in right now. His followers, not consumers, okay? His followers are the people uh, that, that changed the world once. And perhaps this generation, this group of people here at LifePoint Crossing, are the followers that can change this world, at least our world, again. And so you got some next steps I'd encourage you to take. I, a lot of times like to think of them in four G's, right? There's, there's gather, grow, give, and go. And, you know, and we're working on the gathering part of this, but you can do this outside of here as well. You can begin to grow with someone. There's discussion questions. I always encourage you to go online. Go a little deeper with this. Personalize this. Talk through this with somebody else. Make this a part of who you are, right? Give of yourself uh, and then go. Go share it with someone else. And by all means, by all means, I encourage you, don't miss next week as we continue to lean into this. But what, would you, let me just pray with you. Father, I do thank you this morning for, for what you've done for us. God, help us not to miss the, the invitation uh, because, of, because of the religion or because of, of what we're so comfortable with. God, help us to not be so short-sighted. But thank you. Thank you for challenging us. Thank you for, for encouraging us to step out in faith because that's where we find you. That's where we see you at work. So God, this morning, as we continue to lean into this, I just pray that you would make it practical for us as well as we go about our lives this week, especially through the challenges we face. God, give us an opportunity to grow in our faith and to grow in our relationships with you and other people. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.